It's not nine yet. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Nahati. I work for Intel. I work on Swift upstream. Uh, here's with me Ganesh. Um, you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Ganesh. I'm a software developer at Intel. I work on Swift as well. Uh, so today we're going to uh, talk about middle layers and here's the agenda. We are going to have an overview of Swift, uh, starting with overview of Swift and we will talk about WSGI application, WSGI middleware and we'll see uh, some uh, very uh, sample middleware and sample uh, application and we will also see a sample test for it um, and then uh, co what configurations and setup is needed for to to do that and then some of the references that you could go back and take a look at. Also you could uh, download the slides um, from the link that's given here. Uh, it's a Dropbox link. It's also at the end of the slide. So I think uh, Ganesh will start with Swift overview. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello everyone. So um, let's do a quick overview of Swift. Uh, what is Swift? Swift is an object storage system in OpenStack. It was one of the first two systems that got enabled in OpenStack. I believe in 2010. Um, it is a massively scalable, very efficient and um, system. Um, it touts high durability and high availability with uh, eventual consistency as being the other effect. Um, Swift, you don't need any underlying systems to use Swift. You can use a bunch of hard disks, format them in XFS format, and that's how Swift stores all its files. And you can, you can start using it. Um, the objects are stored in those and the metadata of the object is stored along with it as X attributes. Um, Swift is not a file system and it is um, not a static web service, but you, with the help of middleware, you can enable a static web service using Swift and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about the Swift architecture. It is basically a two-tier architecture, as you can see here. Uh, there is a proxy tier that handles concurrent requests, and there is a storage tier which takes care of your objects, accounts, and containers. So you have accounts that can have multiple containers, and a container can have multiple objects, and that's sort of how the cascade sits. So if you have an application that, um, say, has very high concurrent region IC, um, you can just keep adding more proxy servers into the load balancer, and that should satisfy a request. And if you need high storage and a lot less writes, you can keep multiplying on the container servers or the account servers or the object servers. So based on where you need, you can add those respective servers. So this makes it very efficient to add systems without having to just multiply your object, multiply your systems just so you need an extra, say, storage for a few extra objects and stuff like that. Um, let's do a quick demo here. So. Uh, well, not a demo as such, but how Swift works. So here you can see that there are four nodes. Each node is an object storage node. So when the client requests an object to be put in place, it, um, yeah, so you do a put request to the proxy server. The proxy server finds the three particular nodes to which the object has to be stored. Uh, it uses a ring implementation to find out, uh, to come up with predefined locations where this object has to be stored, and the object is written to all those three locations. Uh, what you're seeing here is the replication model. Uh, Swift also now supports erasure coding. So if you prefer not to have three replicas, but use erasure coding to use reduce space and have it in you know, 1.5 times the size instead of three times, you can use erasure coding as well. And when you try to retrieve the object, um, the client does a get request. The proxy finds the closest node from where the object can be retrieved, and it passes it back along to the client. Um, in, this is also equally configurable. So you can have the Swift, you can have, you can program Swift to actually reach out to all the nodes and the first node who returns back can pass the object or you can ask it to find the closest node and Swift goes on finding out which is the closest node as you progress and it'll use that particular node. You'll give it more affinity when on future requests of reads. Um, what are the more common use cases on Swift and what will be more effective on Swift? So uh, data backups, for example. Um, Swift has the attribute where you can say, you can give a timeline at which point an object has to expire. And so basically when you put the object, you can use this header file and say this is, you can either say the time, 
time delay from now, or you can give a specific date. And at that point, Swift has a object reconciler at the back end, which will go up and wipes all the objects you have. Um, Swift is perfect for large objects. Um, I think the Swift client as such has a limit of five gigs of object, but you can have um, static um, SLO and DLO, which is dynamic large objects and static large objects, and you can actually split your objects into smaller chunks and just upload it to Swift concurrently, and it uses a manifest file to track all these objects. And on your subsequent read, it will concatenate everything and you get a single object back. Uh, the more common use case would be the web content and general data storage array, where you have very high concurrent reads and for a very temporary amount of time. So you basically, uh, Swift gets you an object and you should be done. And so what are Swift middlewares? So the way, the way Swift architecture is written is the code as such has a limited set of functionality. This so, so that the code can remain clean and you don't have to worry about adding, you know, becoming big and stuff like that. And you start adding features as middlewares along the pipeline. And then you create this giant pipeline where you, know, you have a WSG server, and then you have all these middlewares through them. And then you have the application of the proxy server or whatever is at the other end, which handles the thing. Um, for example, the, in the all-in-one, if you see Swift actually has, I think, 15 middlewares before the object, before the request actually gets to the proxy server. And that's after that proxy server goes on trying to figure out what it has to do with it. Um, and like I said, and the Swift, the core proxy server code is much more cleaner, and then you can add features in your middlewares. You can extend features from what your existing middlewares and stuff like that. It just makes it much more easier to deploy. Um, so let's look at some of the middlewares that we have. So if you take a all-in-one deployment that you have today in Swift, um, you will find these to be some of the middlewares. So the first one you see here is the catch error middleware, which is a very high level error checking. So that's the first one in the pipeline. So as soon as your put request or get request gets in, the catch error middleware actually is the first one who gets to see it. And what it does is make sure that there is a transaction ID for every single request, or if there is something misformed, it actually returns the code back. So it doesn't have to go all the way to the proxy app. The next one is a gatekeeper middleware, which is um, used for header filtering. So any, so Swift has two sets of headers, like there is a user headers that you can have and there's system headers. So this sort of makes sure that the client never passes a system header that shouldn't go. And similarly, on a response back from the server, none of the system headers actually get out. Something that shouldn't go out never goes out. And you have a few more that goes along the line. And then you have this temp URL where, say you have an object and you want to have a URL from which you can actually download, directly access this object for a limited period of time. You can ask Swift to give you a URL, and you and and you can I think it's a configurable amount of time that you have, and the object can be retrieved directly from the URL without having to go and authenticate with Swift over and over and over again. And there is a static web um, middleware that you can use for your container. So basically, if you enable this as a header file, it's also a header option. And if you enable this in Swift, what it does is you can add uh, your index, your error, HTML. You can actually have CSS files. And it'll let you browse your objects that's inside the container using a set URL. And this is sort of how the pipeline is set up. And then you have some more, and then eventually it gets to the proxy app. Um, there are a lot of third-party middlewares that's also been developed and in use today. So for example, the Swift 3 middleware helps making Swift uh, compatible with Amazon S3. So if you have an application that's written in Amazon S3, and if you want to move all your objects over from S3 to Swift, you pop in the middleware, and your application doesn't have to change it. It does the same call, and Swift translates this to Swift's object storage, and just makes it much easier for you to move and port. Um, SWAuth is the, it's a standalone, so it's an authentication middleware that you can use so that your Swift can be standalone, and you don't necessarily have to use Keystone, for example, to be your authentication server. You don't have to run an extra service. Everything is tracked in the SWAuth. Um, Swift Inspector is an excellent debugging middleware. It, it helps, it sort of gives you a profile of every single request that goes to the proxy server. It will tell you how long it took for the proxy server to complete the request, or which are the containers, which are the actual nodes where the object is supposed to be stored, and where it is stored, and all these sort of information. And you can do it per transaction ID. So, you, sorry. Sure. Um, it's it, it is built in middleware for authentication. Correct. Um, so we are using Keystone as for authentication mechanism. Correct. So are you saying that you don't need to use Keystone if we use X or SWR? 
Correct. So if, you, if you're running Swift alone and you don't need, or in your particular use case, you have, don't have any other services from OpenStack and you just need Swift. You don't necessarily have to run Keystone. SWR sort of satisfies that criteria, criteria for you. So, so what I wanted to ask is, how does SWR compare with Keystone? Meaning the, uh, the algorithm of type. Keystone has more secure algorithm or SWR? Ha have you compared that? I have not compared SWR than Keystone, sorry. Uh, yeah, so uh, Swift Inspector is a very good middleware for debugging, and it helps you a lot. And I think with that, Marty will yeah. take over, and she'll talk about Visgi applications. Um, uh, so a lot of uh, um, OpenStack projects use middleware, and we use Visgi standard for it. So uh, let's have a look at what Visgi app is, what uh, Visgi middleware is, and let's have an example of uh, a, a little sample example. Uh, the code that I show in here, you can, uh, it can be, uh, it can be run, and I mean it, it, it actually works, and you can download it from the link uh, that's that on, that's on the first slide and uh, the end of it. Um, so uh, what's a what's a Visgi app? Uh, a Visgi is a, it's a Python standard, and it's uh, it's used to describe how uh, servers communicate with applications. Um, so, but what is a Visgi application object? And in Swift case, a Visgi, the Visgi application is the proxy server. Uh, an application object is uh, is a callable, and a callable. What is a callable? A callable can be a function or uh, a method or a class within a call a call method. Uh, so it has a standard wherein it, it accepts to positional arguments, uh, like you say, environment and start response. Uh, you can name it anything that you want. Uh, you, uh, it's not necessary that we use the same names, but uh, they are positional. And environment is a dictionary, and start response is a callable. Uh, for instance, environment dictionary has a request method, and like I'm sure these are the most common ones that we use. Uh, so I've put them here. The uh, environment usually consists of CGI variables and uh, WSGI input, uh, I mean WSGI variables. Some of them can be empty and uh, some of them cannot. Uh, these are the ones that I've listed here are the most commonly used ones. Uh, a request method is, uh, uh, it can be a get or a put or uh, I mean the most common ones. And path info is what is in the URL. A uh, query string is also, uh, we'll see an example, I'm sure uh, a lot of you must be familiar with it. Content type is, uh, again, you yeah, have the type of uh, data that you're passing in, but gain input is your data. So uh, start response is also a callable uh, with uh, two, two positional arguments which are necessary, which are required. Uh, there is also a third argument, which is an exception, which captures the exceptions. Uh, say you have, uh, the application has trapped an exception and it wants to display it back to the browser, so that's what you use. Uh, headers are supposed to be a list of tuples which, uh, wherein you, you, uh, you use header name and header value. Status is, uh, the 200 OK, for instance, here is the success status. Again, these uh, you can use any other names that you that you want, but uh, but they're still positional arguments. Uh, so here is a simple Visgi app. Well, what I'm doing is I am importing a server and I uh, I'm displaying environment uh, environment variables and with I'm filtering I'm, I'm only displaying query string. I'm calling start response before the body because uh, the client requires headers and status before you return a body. Uh, in this case, I am supplying the application JSON as my content type. I am, and also displaying query string uh, variable from the environment. So let's see, uh, and I'm invoking a server on my local host. And I, uh, so I took a screenshot of the demo of, uh, of this. And, um, So, uh, so I, I, my simple app.py has my, uh, the application that I've shown right now. And uh, the, the get that you're seeing here right now is uh, that, that gets called after I, do, after I give my curl command, which is uh, I'm passing a query string hello. So as you can see, it is the query string is displayed and content type is what we have displayed, which is application JSON. And, 
so this is a sample uh, uh, WSGI application uh, which is really simple and very, very basic which is just uh, displaying a query string and it's, we are modifying the content type. Uh, I'll use this uh, application in my, in my sample middleware. Uh, so let, but what's a middleware before we go to the sample of it? Uh, middleware can act as a server or an application. If a middleware is wrapping another middleware, that is uh, the one that is wrapped is, is acts as an application. Uh, sorry, the one that is wrapped acts as a server and the one that is being wrapped acts as an application. Uh, whatever I'm wrapping, whatever a middleware is wrapping, it can be a middleware or it can be an application. If it's wrapping a middleware and a middleware uh, right next to each other, then that's what we call as a middleware stack. Uh, so, uh, a couple of instances where it's used is rerouting, uh, I mean, routing a request based on URL by modifying your environment variables, or another instance is load balancing uh, by passing your request from one network to the other. And uh, yeah, I mean, it allows multiple applications to run side by side, as I just uh, uh, was just talking. So uh, when a request or a response gets passed, a middleware gets a chance to look at it and modify if, if, if that's what the middleware is required to do so. So here's my sample middleware. Uh, so what, what is it doing is if I, I have a callable method uh, like uh, uh, which, which, which is taking to position arguments, which is environment and start response. I, if I pass on uh, an example uh, method called as foo, uh, it's supposed to throw an error, which is 418 number teapot. Uh, and it's the content type, uh, I'm, I'm modifying it to text plane. I mean, I, am, I have given it as text plane. Uh, if you remember, if, uh, if you've noticed in the previous, my WSGI application, the content type is, I've given it as application JSON. Um, so I'm returning an error body with an error status if I pass on a request method as foo, otherwise I return my app. I'm invoking my server, uh, which is uh, localhost, and the simple, I mean, I'm, I'm wrapping my application into the middleware. I'm calling my app from the middleware. Um, so I, uh, I took a screenshot of the demo as well. So my, uh, I passed on my first curl request without, uh, uh, I mean, uh, my first, he, the next two lines that you're seeing here is as a, uh, an output of curl command of get and foo. Uh, for instance, here I am, my, my query string is hello. Uh, I'm not passing a request method. So the default is get. So I'm, I'm simply doing a get here. So uh, all is well. It's calling the application. It's not calling the error. So what is my application supposed to display? It's supposed to display my query string and give my content type as application JSON, which is what it's doing. Uh, so now I've, I'm passing a request method foo, and it's, uh, as expected, as we see, it's returning an error body, and it's, it has modified the content type to text plane, and it is returning an error status, which is 418 amateur part. So testing a middleware, it can be, it's, it's rather straightforward. Wh whatever I'm doing right here is I am faking my application and all I, all I really want to test is my middleware. Not, uh, I'm not bothered about my application. I just want to see how my middleware reacts if I supply it a method called as foo. So I am passing it, I am calling a request URL and I am getting my response and I'm asserting that it's, the status is equivalent to what I supplied. Uh, in, in my previous examples, we saw that uh, we're calling the application, I mean, the middleware is wrapped. So if, what if we have multiple middlewares? If we cannot, uh, I mean, we, the code will not be maintainable. We cannot keep on wrapping middlewares after one after the other. And that's why we have page deploy, which uh, helps us configure it. It is used to configure WSGI applications and WSGI servers. Uh, in, in, in case of a WSGI consumer, it, it looks for, uh, it provides a lo load app function wherein we supply a configuration file. But in our case, since we are WSGI providers, it, need, it looks for an entry point. Uh, and uh, so where is this entry point? We look for an entry point, and uh, we have config files and setup files for it. Our config file is styled in uh, INI format, which is the uh, informal standard, which has, uh, which is a, uh, 
tuple of name and I mean uh, name value pairs. Uh, our config file defines what uh, what server to use, what applications, what middlewares are we doing. We we give all those values in our in our config file. So here is a, uh, this config file is directly from uh, Swift and I, I've just chosen sections which are more relevant and which are different, which mean something. So uh, the top one is pipeline, which is uh, wherein we have uh, a lie, I mean, middleware stacked up and when you're declaring a pipeline, it's supposed to end with an application. Uh, in this case, our application is proxy server. Uh, and if you notice, pipeline is uh, the value that the value that pipeline type has is main. Uh, when you declare it as a main, it, we are telling it that to treat this as a default application. And the next section is filter, wherein we are, we are saying that uh, it's a middleware. Middleware has declared, are declared as filters. We'll come to, the, we'll come to uh, the syntax, why it's swift hash cell check and how does it recognize anything like that and what configuration is uh, a log level, uh, what does it do and why are we declaring it here? And then in the next section, what we have is, uh, we're declaring our application, which is proxy server, and we're also passing on some configuration with it. Uh, so this syntax, the Swift hash hell check or Swift hash proxy, that is what, uh, it, uh, it looks in entry points for protocols like application protocol, app factory, and filter factory, wherein we are declaring our applications and our filters, which are middlewares. So here we're telling that when you encounter Swift hash hell, hell check, go and look for, uh, lo go and look in my module called as filter factory, uh, uh, sorry, go and look for my function called as filter factory, which is in the module Swift common middleware health check. And likewise for app factories and uh, which is the applications, we have object, proxy, container, and also memcache, which is not here. So the default is also a part of uh, our um, config file. Uh, the default section is supposed to give us the global configuration. Multiple applications might need a similar configuration, so you, uh, whatever is in the default section, that is treated as global configuration, which can be overridden by using a variable called as set. Um, so where do we use this global and local configuration? This is an example where um, uh, this this f filter factory is also right from uh, Swift. It's a health check which is used for monitoring. If we pass on slash health check, it's uh, it's going to give you um, 200 OK. And uh, so it, what it's doing is it's taking the request. I mean the re the health check middleware. We're taking a request and it's returning a filtered uh, uh, filtered request or uh, yeah the middleware is going to filter. That's what the names reflect. It's, it, what it intakes is the global configuration is what we saw in the default con in the default section. It's taken as a dictionary, and the local configuration is passed as keyword arguments. The app factory that I have here is um, rather very simple. It's just returning with the application. That's merely an example. That's not in Swift. I didn't take it from Swift. So we'll t uh, we'll take a look at how uh, Keystone. Uh, how enabling Keystone is going to, it's a, it's a middleware uh, in Swift, uh, so how enabling it is going to reflect and uh, what is going to change in the logs or how is it going to uh, look like. Uh, Ganesh will do that. Thanks. All right, so let's take a look at how to enable Keystone in Swift. Um, so uh, SAIO stands for Swift All-in-One, right? so probably that's too Swiss, but um, th those, that's the location from where you can actually find the documentation how to install an SAIO. And the method that I use to install Keystone is in that link. And in the Keystone sources, I use the branch stable Metaka. And I recently came to know that they've changed the way the Keystone application is run, so I don't know if you take the trunk, if that steps will be relevant. But if it's not, please reach out to the Keystone team. They'll really love to hear from you. Um, in the SAIO, if you take a look at the default pipeline that you have, you'll actually see something called tempoth, uh, which is what Swift uses at least temporarily to, um, you know, for local testing and stuff. And right below that, like Mati said, you have a filter section which talks about 
how tempauth is set up. So there is a container test, sorry, there's an account test, um, and the user tester has the password testing, and he's an admin. There is a test2 account, tester2 testing2, and he's also an admin. There is a tester3 who is part of the account test, but he's not an admin. So this is, this is sort of set up this way so that you can figure out if, if you add something as an admin and if you don't have listing permissions or rewrite permissions, you can actually verify with the other user. Um, so if you do a Swift stat, you can see it is using the test account and it comes back with a bunch of data, like you have nothing in this. And if you look at the Swift proxy logs, um, you will see that the user test, well in this test, actually the user test has used this password testing tester and he's made a, he's reached out to the application and it came back, well he has the right permissions to reach it, so he got it back and it works fine. And how do you enable Keystone? So Using the steps as mentioned below, uh, run Keystone, you have to create the Swift service, um, Swift as a service account in Keystone, uh, make him the admin in the service project in Keystone, and you definitely have to add the Swift endpoints to Keystone to make it aware how it works. And most importantly, you'll need the Keystone middleware, which is uh, one of the plugins the Keystone team is developing uh, from one of the Python pip packages. And you change your pipeline in such a way, so you remove tempoth, you add auth token and keystone auth. And this is sort of how you define auth token. So if you see auth token is basically the keystone middleware uh, filter factory. You give the keystone URL, the private and the public URLs. Um, more important is that when you create the Swift user, you have to make sure that your passwords and matches the same way what you're listing here. Otherwise, you probably won't be able to have a successful authentication. And um, you also have the Keystone app, Keystone auth middleware, sorry. And with that, when I make a Swift stat request, you sort of see something like this. And if you look at the proxy logs, it's a little muddled, but um, if you see the first two lines, it's saying it's going to make an authentication. The third line, actually, you can see it's reached out to Keystone in port 35357. And then you have a response from Keystone that says, here is your token, this is how long it's valid, and all the other details that you need from it. And if you look at the Keystone logs, you will see that the application has actually reached out and has basically got some keys and tokens. And this is sort of how you enable Keystone with Swift. Um, the references are here. You have uh, the PEP uh, specifications. You have paste deploy. Uh, so the updated one is, uh, it's not PEP 0333. It's actually, there is an updated spec to it, which is 333, I mean, 3333. If you, there is a link in within the reference as well. Uh, the base deploy, uh, these are really good links wherein you can, uh, there are a lot more examples and detailed ex explanations for the standards and what's going on. Uh, the uh, Swift middleware is, uh, also has a better example and a little more which elaborates on how it, uh, how it works within Swift. Uh, like we haven't seen, right now we haven't seen a demo of how, uh, how to enable a middleware. We just, we only saw screenshots of it. We have, we don't, we didn't show any code of Swift middleware, but the link right there helps you do that. And uh, uh, yeah, the development middleware and development auth is an example middleware that I was talking about. And yeah. thanks. Uh, yeah, you and you, we can download the slides and test out the sample code from the Dropbox link that's that's up here. Any questions? All right. Thanks. All right, thank you.